Welcome back. Hey, and we're back. So um, before our next talk, we have some fun interactive game for you all. Um, so as developers, we all have opinions. And uh, uh, our sponsor, AppSignal, has created these really fun interactive cards called Developer Dilemmas. So you will see uh, uh, a link of uh, uh, the one of the Developer Dilemma cards right in the chat. And basically, you can pick your favorite. What kind of developer are you? Are you a move fast, break things person? Or are you strive for zero errors kind of person developer? So jump in, cast your vote, but wait, don't go anywhere just yet. Like, don't touch that dial, because we still have Penelope's talk coming up. And um, I'm sure Ramon can tell a bit more about her. Please, Ramon. Absolutely, I'd be happy to. So Penelope is a director at rubycentral.org, which amongst other things, uh, brings us RubyConf and RailsConf. She's led the development of RSpec in the past, as well as major uh, one of the major testing rules uh, tools for Ruby. And she's been writing Ruby for just about a decade, uh, around the time of 1.8.6. And she's gonna tell us all about Ruby formatter. So please, Penelope. Take it away. The stage is yours. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I see you have my slides. Cool. All right, let's go. Hi, everyone. This is Building Ruby Format. Let's get started. So to build on that introduction slightly, my name is Penelope Fippen. Uh, I go by Penelope Zone almost everywhere on the internet. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a trans woman. As mentioned, I am a director at Ruby Central. Ruby Central is the 501c3 not-for-profit in the United States that organizes RubyConf and RailsConf. And so every year we put on the two sort of like largest, biggest like uh, conferences in our community. And we have uh, RubyConf coming up in, in just a little while. The CFP for RubyConf is currently open and like every conference this year, it's going to be entirely virtual. Um, and so if you have not yet submitted a talk to RubyConf, I would highly encourage you to do so. Uh, this is a great way to get uh, started, and especially uh, because it's a large event that this year you don't have to travel for, I would really encourage you to submit. Uh, along with my, my role at Ruby Central, I will also be uh, program chairing RailsConf next year, and it's not quite clear to us whether RailsConf in April will be virtual or in person yet, but I'd also encourage you to watch out and submit to that when the CFP opens. Um, the other thing I wanted to say before I got too far into this is um, this slide deck that I have been building crashed Keynote this morning when I was working on it, like an update occurred or something. So we're all gonna pray that like computers work uh this morning and hopefully everything will be fine and with that sort of like preamble out of the way let's get into it and talk about like what ruby format actually is and like the the easiest answer to that question is like ruby format is a ruby auto formatter and like i could finish the talk here and like that would answer the question but it's not like super useful so instead let's go like straight to a demonstration so like what you see here is me just like typing some Ruby. And the thing that you will probably most note about this Ruby code is it looks nothing like the Ruby code you would write on a daily basis. It's really bad. I save the file though, and the code just snaps into place. And this is Ruby format working in the background. Ruby format is designed to just sit there in your editor, watch for your changes, and every time you save your file, overwrite it with a formatted version. In other words, Ruby format is a program that is designed to consume Ruby source code transform it and output semantically equivalent Ruby source code just with very much cleaned up formatting. And, and that's like sort of the core idea. Ruby format is a program that transforms Ruby programs into equivalent ones that just have cleaner formatting. But like beyond that, Ruby format is also designed to be a program that lives in your editor. Like one of my sort of like core philosophies is formatting should happen as you're editing not like, uh, you know, in CI, like you shouldn't have to have this whole back and forth, you should be able to get it in almost real time. And so like to that end, like 
from the very beginning, Ruby format was designed to be a program that lives in your text editor. Today, we have like strong support for VMAC, uh, Vim, Emacs, and Atom. Uh, Sublime support is like kind of questionable and like I'm not really sure what's going on with VS Code. If you are a VS Code or Sublime user, please, 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 please come to the Ruby format issue tracker and like test it out and let us know whether or not it works for you. Um, I would really love to like finally release this thing with full support for all of the text editors. Um, the other thing that's like sort of very important about Ruby format is that it's fast. It's really, really fast. And like, this is just a necessary feature if you live in somebody's text editor. You don't want to be in a place where you like save the file and then have to wait an appreciable amount of time before you can resume editing. And so like to that end, the sort of like performance numbers as they stand today is that if you run Ruby format over a 2,500 line file, it's gonna take 60 milliseconds. It's going to like finish faster than you can notice that like anything has been happening. And this is really powerful because it enables that kind of like uh, format on save workflow I demonstrated earlier. But the thing that's really interesting about designing in this like performance as a feature is that it means that like on sort of like larger applications, like you can run Ruby format on your entire project in like very little time. At its sort of peak, Ruby format can do about 30,000 lines of Ruby code per second. And if you think about what that means, inserting Ruby format onto even like very, very large Ruby applications as a CI pass is going to barely take any time whatsoever. And like, this means that it's gonna enable you both to use it in your editor and enable you to use it in CI. And I think that's like a really cool and powerful benefit. Um, Ruby format also has no style related configuration. Unlike Rubicop, there's no rubicop.yaml, there's no flags to change how formatting works. Like Ruby format has one style, that is the style. And like, there's nothing you can really do to change it besides like actually changing the code of Ruby format itself. Um, and this is really powerful. And I'll talk about why I made this decision in a little bit, but like it ends up making the program incredibly simple as a side effect. Um, Ruby format is also designed to work like a Unix tool. Uh, and what that means is it can like consume on standard in and output to standard out. It has flags for changing modes of operation. But the idea here is that like by designing Ruby format as a Unix tool, it can interop with a whole bunch of other tools because fundamentally text and pipes are like a universal interface, right? And so like, if you just say Ruby format file name, it's gonna output to standard out and let you chain that with other stuff. Uh, we have flags for in place, it works with directories and, and so on and so on, right? It's like designed very much from the beginning to be one of those like simple do one thing well Unix tools that we've heard about. And like one of the side effects of this Unix tool like design is that Ruby format is not a gem. Ruby format is not a gem, Ruby format will never be a gem. And like, this has actually been a point of some controversy. It turns out that Ruby developers really want to be able to access their tools via Ruby gems. But if you think about what Ruby format is, kind of this command line program that like can't actually even be loaded into a Ruby project, like it's not a Ruby library you can just load in, it doesn't really make any sense to distribute uh, Ruby format as a Ruby gem. Um, and so like, it's never the case that I want you to gem install Ruby format, but there will be alternate uh, distribution channels available. And today we use uh, GitHub releases. And so you may be thinking to yourself like, cool, Penelope, that's great. Uh, I really want to use this. Like a Ruby auto formatter is exactly the tool my team has been looking for. Can I have it please? And like, unfortunately, like the answer is no, like it's not really ready for usage yet, but it's like less strong of a no than it was uh, the last time I gave this talk in the spring at Brighton Ruby. Like Ruby format is kind of in a state today where if you don't mind some sharp edges, you could download and play with it, but it probably will still uh, do some interesting things. So like, like prima facie, um, it won't 
break your code anymore. Like there were versions of Ruby format that I released where you could run it on your project and it would transform your code and produce either invalid Ruby files or Ruby files that did something different to the Ruby file that came in. And obviously that's really not what you want from a tool like this. Um, and so like we fixed that. And the way we did that is just by like testing the hell out of it. So today Ruby format runs CI, not only on like examples of like small units of Ruby code, but also like entire open source repositories, like all of RSpec and some of the ThoughtBot Rails applications to really begin to uh, push the boundaries of like the testing. And so, so what this means is we have a high degree of confidence that if you run Ruby format on a Ruby program, it won't break that Ruby program. It will either fail to format it or produce a new Ruby, Ruby program, which is semantically equivalent. And like, this is exactly what we want uh, from Ruby format. So like, we have at least solved the testing problem. But like, the, the problem now is that some of the output has really sharp edges. And in particular, like today, Ruby format kind of deletes your comments uh, a bunch of the time. And like, people really like their comments. Comments are very important uh, to folks. And so, you know, if you're okay with testing a program that will format your Ruby nicely, but might delete all your comments, that's fine. I would not recommend it for day-to-day -day, uh, production use yet. Um, so you might be asking yourself, like, Penelope, why are you doing this? Like, this seems like a really hard problem. Uh, why on earth would you decide to build a Ruby auto formatter? And to answer that, I kind of want to talk about this, this idea I vaguely mentioned on the Greater Than Code podcast, which is this, this idea of like a hierarchy of nitpicking. And so for those of you that have been around for a while, you may remember like building Ruby before we had RuboCop, like you would fire up a pull request and people would be like, I think we should use like the new hash syntax versus the old hash syntax. Or like, I think like you should do it this way instead of that way. Or like, you know, this seems error prone. What about like, like those kinds of sort of like nit very small nitpicky conversations in pull request review where it didn't matter, but somebody was trying to make an argument from consistency. And this is like a, this is like a pretty valid thing to do, right? We want our code to look consistent so that somebody new uh, to a file can begin to understand it because like similar structures look the same, right? And then, and then Rubicop came in, right? And, and with Rubicop, you have sort of the ability to begin to enforce some of those nitpicks uh, by automating it. But like Rubocop has this problem that like almost nobody likes the Rubocop defaults. And so like every single Ruby application I've ever worked on has a customized Rubocop configuration. Well, it turns out that like customizing your Rubocop configuration is just taking those nitpicks and moving them to a different place. You've moved them from a place where like one person it will like always put them in a pull request to a place where like now the team has sort of like agreed on them and now they're being done in an automated fashion. Except that like, it turns out this doesn't really solve the nitpicking problem either because it turns out that like what a uh, pull request review actually exposes really strongly is sort of like an idea of power dynamics around uh, things like being underrepresented, gender minorities, race minorities, uh, disabilities, like uh, being non-neurotypical um, and so on and so on, right? And like, um, it is very clear from data, if you look at open source data, if you look at some companies' internal data, um, like men tend to get their pull requests approved more quickly than women, uh, get fewer comments, get fewer nitpicks, that like all of that stuff, right? Um, and like with a rubicop.yaml, what we actually see is um, people uh, trying to make changes to a rubicop configuration will have an easier time if they have more power. Um, and so like th there's this really interesting like aspect of code re review that inherently exposes the, the social power dynamics in software engineering. And so like building Ruby format, there is no configuration. There's no place for you and your company to have that argument, right? You have to come to like the Ruby format repo and argue in the open why it's better for like the entire language to look this way. It sort of like entirely eliminates the problem of having this discussion and by doing so, removes an opportunity for subtle power dynamics to play uh, themselves out. 
And like, this was not actually like the original intention of the construction of Ruby format. Um, but it came to me when I had a conversation with someone who was a relatively junior engineer who was a woman. And what she said to me really resonated with me. She said, I'm really excited for Ruby format because I work with this, this guy who's an asshole senior and he like will never listen to me when I make suggestions that for, for changes to our Rubocop configuration that could improve it. And I'm excited for Ruby format because it means like I don't have to make uh, those arguments when I disagree with some configuration because instead like that person has to go argue with you, Penelope, right? And like now, of course, you could just argue and it's totally reasonable to argue that we are now moving this power dynamics problem onto Penelope. Um, and the sort of like broad answer to that is one of like Ruby format is kind of community sourced and I am just leading it, right? Like ultimately the decisions are mine at the end of the day, but like I am well placed, I think, to uh, adopt these changes uh, in a way that like many individual teams are not. Uh, and so that's sort of like the hierarchy of nitpicking argument in a nutshell. Um, I'd also like to talk just a little bit about like the existing solution space, right? Nobody has ever actually tried to build a Ruby auto formatter. Um, that are like the closest existing solution, right? Isn't actually great at the formatting task. Like it's Rubocop, right? Like we've talked about it a bunch already. And Rubocop is great at many things. Rubocop is a really useful Ruby linting tool, but like formatting just isn't a core competency of Rubocop. And like, that's fine. Tools don't have to be great at everything. But like Rubicop introduces this fixed flag as like a separate part of its architecture to the like detecting problems piece. And because like Rubicop was never built from the ground up to accomplish this task, it's just like naturally not as good at it as a tool homegrown and specially designed to solve this problem. In fact, like when Justin Searles and I were working on standard, which is like Justin's layer on top of Rubicop that also attempts to solve this config this uh, configuration problem, we actually found that sort of like the biggest source of Rubicop bugs were hyphen hyphen fix. And that like in particular, Rubicop can get into these cycles where it's trying to fix something and then it detects a new problem and it tries to fix that and it puts the old problem back in place. And it does this forever until it crashes. This is actually a behavior I've seen in Rubicop uh, recently in my day to day work at Stripe. Um, and so, like, Right, Rubicop was just never designed to solve this problem. We need a whole new class of tool to do it. And like, as I've mentioned, right, Ru uh, Rubicop enables the worst kind of bike shed. Like Rubicop has literally hundreds of configuration flags. And unless you've gone through all of them and made a conscious decision, you're opting into the defaults. And like the defaults may actually not be appropriate for your team and your context, right? And deciding which ones you want can be a long and arduous process. And so like my sort of like core goal with the Ruby format project is to eliminate all of this work we're doing, uh, configuring, configuring Rubicop for formatting and instead moving all of that into Ruby format. Um, as you might have guessed, I believe that tiny focus tools are good. Ruby format only does one thing. It formats Ruby files. Ruby format can't lint to your Ruby files. It can't tell you if some structure is likely problematic or incorrect. Ruby format doesn't know how to do that. What it does know how to do is format files really, really quickly. And as I've mentioned, Ruby format has no style related configuration. And what that means is we have to get style right, basically like the first time, because I don't want you to have to do like one huge formatting commit and then like two or three years down the line, do another huge formatting commit. And so the way I'm sort of thinking about this is like, I really kind of want Ruby format to only ever have one major version and that would be 1.0. And we would define a major version as something where you run the formatter and it formats everything. And then like, that's it. It will never reformat the same piece of code until you change it because we want like, uh, style to remain consistent throughout Ruby format. And so to do that, like we're being very, very careful about the formatting decisions we make. And I am very much taking my time and thinking through things. And also like I have like made decisions being like, this is what we will do. And then reverse those decisions because I've realized they were actually the wrong decision after I've learned more 
about Ruby's syntax. And like the perfect example of this is trailing commas. So like intuitively, I think a lot of us like trailing commas because they minimize git churn uh, on uh, structures where there are new lines separated by commas, right? But as I was building Ruby format, I found myself adding more and more complexity uh, in order to be able to correctly deal with trailing commas, because it turns out trailing commas are not valid in a number of places in Ruby's syntax. They're not valid in uh, params lists with uh, optional arguments, and they're not valid in the equivalent positions in arg lists and a, a few other special cases, right? And so I was looking at this and I was like, well, I'm dealing with all of this complexity to make it work for the few cases I want, what happens if I remove like trailing commas everywhere? Just enforce there will be no trailing commas. And the code of Ruby format got a lot simpler by doing this. And what this said to me is that um, probably having trailing commas is bad. And so I changed my opinion, right? And this is all to say, if you disagree with something Ruby format is doing, please come to GitHub and file an issue and we will talk about it. I would rather get this right than hold on to what I think my opinions are. The goal is to have a minimal consistent subset of the Ruby language. And to do that, basically what we're doing is we're taking all of the possible Ruby and we're squishing it down to a subset of the grammar. Like the output of Ruby format is much less than the sum total of all Ruby that is possible. Ruby format actually outputs a minimal subset of Ruby. And I think that's a really powerful idea to build this consistency. So that's kind of like the what and the philosophy. Now I'd like to get actually sort of like down into the nitty gritty and talk about the implementation details. So like originally, uh, Ruby format was written entirely end to end in Ruby. It would consume a Ruby file, build a data structure called a parse tree using a Ruby library called Ripper, which basically consumes Ruby source and produces this data structure, uh, some code to walk the data structure and produce what's called a rendering queue, which is basically just like a list of tokens to be output to a file. And then it would walk the rendering queue to output those into the file. Um, the Ruby standard library in call includes a Ruby parser called Ripper. Um, and what this means basically is that like we can run Ripper over Ruby files and get syntax trees. Um, and the syntax trees look like this. They are basically arrays where the first item in the array is a tag representing the thing that has just been parsed. And then the array contains more nodes indicating things like the name or the value or the position. And to perhaps make this more concrete, if you open up IRB and call ripper.sexp over a string of Ruby code, it will actually produce uh, an array which is the parse tree that represents that program, right? And so you can see here, like I have a tag like colon at ident, which is a symbol that is at ident with say, and that maps to the identifier say in the program that is the name of the function being called. You can also see we have there arg paren. That's because parentheses are optional in Ruby. And so like the parse tree tells us there were parens there, then args add block, which tells us we have an args list and then at, uh, at int, and then the string one, which tells us there was an argument one, right? And so like you can see here, we have a data structure that represents the program that we can then walk to actually do formatting. And that was basically how Ruby format worked. And we actually got this working to the point where we could get every single test in the RSpec repo passing uh, after all of RSpec had been formatted with Ruby format, which was like a huge win. Uh, and on this 186 line file, this was like plenty fast enough, but on like a 2000 line file, this was too slow. It took 188 milliseconds. And 188 milliseconds is too slow to be able to do Ruby auto formatting. But this begs the question, like, how fast is fast enough? Like how fast does Ruby format have to be in order for it to be a reasonably designed auto formatter? And to answer that question, we need to understand just like a little bit about uh, the performance of modern computers. So if you have a non high refresh rate display, uh, it will refresh uh, 60 times a second and 60 times a second is equivalent to 16 milliseconds. Um, the other performance number that's kind of important here is 100 milliseconds. 100 milliseconds is about the fastest any human can react to like a change on the screen. And so like with these two numbers in mind, we can begin to look at various ways of building Ruby format uh, and their relative performance. So like 
to establish a baseline, if you run bundle exec Rubocop over a four line file, basically like an empty file, how long does it take? And the answer turns out to be about 800 milliseconds. And of that, about 425 milliseconds is bundler booting. And so like, we can't use bundler. We can't be a Ruby gem because if we were, we would imp in, uh, impose a static 400 millisecond cost every time we wanted to run. And that is just too slow to be acceptable uh, to run on save. And we also can't inherit from Rubocop. Like the very first design I had of Ruby format was, well, what if we just loaded Rubocop and like did stuff with that? And, but like Rubocop is also too slow. So let's go to the very other end of the spectrum. What if we just run Ruby on an empty program? Is like Ruby itself fast enough? And it turns out evaluating an empty program with the Ruby interpreter alone takes 75 milliseconds. But there's one thing that's happening here that like we can kind of eliminate. So if you just run Ruby on the command line, it's actually going to load Ruby gems. Uh, Ruby gems is a library. It's not just like the idea of gems and installing them. It is also a library that Ruby will load um, in order to uh, like be able to load Ruby gems. And it turns out you can just turn that off. And so um, like I have this Ruby hyphen hyphen disable equal gems uh, hyphen E empty string. And that only takes 25 milliseconds. And so this is fast enough. Running Ruby uh, without Ruby gems uh, in a 25 millisecond boot gives us 75 milliseconds remaining to actually run a Ruby auto formatter. And so after we like did all of this engineering work, uh, we ran Ruby format on an empty file. Um, and it was basically taking the same amount of time as booting Ruby. That is like uh, Ruby format had no additional overhead over booting Ruby, which was indicative that it would be fast enough uh, to be able to run in this uh, format on save workflow. So we still have this 188 uh, milliseconds runtime. What do we do? Well, I kind of like already sort of talked around this. So let's talk about it directly. Like if you want to write a fast and correct program today, uh, Rust really is the best language uh, that you have available to you to do that. And so I was like, what if I just wrote a Ruby auto formatter in Rust? Surely that will be fun and easy, right? Um, the answer is no. Uh, Parse.y, which is Ruby's um, parser, the thing that the Ripper library I mentioned earlier is built on top of, is actually not separable from the Ruby interpreter. You need to have most of a booted Ruby interpreter available to you in order to be able to run the Ruby parser in order to be able to pass it to Rust. So like what we actually end up with is like Ruby and Rust executing together in this like beautiful marriage of like two of my favorite programming languages in the world. Um, and so like the intermediate state, the state that Ruby format was in for like a little bit of time is we ran a Ruby process. That Ruby process read the source file, ran Ripper over it, and then turned it into JSON. This, by the way, is the JSON logo. It's this weird circle-y gray thing. Um, and so what we had is this big JSON blob. And then we sent the JSON blob into a Rust program because I was like, how do you send things between languages? You use JSON, right? It, it totally works. Um, so it was a really bad idea, but it was enough to get going. And then we just turned the JSON back into the exact same data structure as we had on the Ruby side. And then we do like all of the computation in Rust and it's like way faster. This, this structure with JSON was actually fast enough um, for us to be able to uh, like run in less than a hundred milliseconds on every file, but like JSON's not ideal. Like it would be great if we didn't have to do that. Um, and so we don't. Uh, today, what we actually do is instead of passing JSON between Ruby and Rust, uh, we pass a pointer to the Ruby objects. Um, it turns out that the Ruby interpreter is written in C. Uh, and so it's very easy to integrate uh, Ruby programs into C programs. And it also turns out it's very easy to integrate C programs into Rust programs. And so basically like we are giving Rust uh, a value which represents a Ruby object. And then Rust itself knows how to navigate the Ruby objects by calling into the Ruby interpreter, which is wild. Um, but it totally works. I also didn't do this alone. Sean Griffin, who is speaking later today, actually did most of the heavy lifting here. 
and it was really great of them to contribute that. I wouldn't have been able to do it on my own. Also, um, for those of you who don't know, this is Sean's daughter. They named their daughter Ruby. Uh, and so I think it is safe for us to say that Sean loves Ruby more than all of us. <sighs> so like, there is not just a performance reason uh, to use Rust. Writing Rust code actually also has a ton of benefits uh, beyond that. Uh, a big one is types. Uh, so instead of expressing everything as like just dynamic types, uh, we can express everything with static types. And what this means is we're able to determine a lot more about how to work with the parse tree at compile time, prevents us from making mistakes. It's very good. Uh, Rust is very fast. This is actually how we achieved the 60 millisecond uh, performance number. Uh, it wouldn't have been possible if we didn't uh, use the Rust language. Uh, so why aren't you done? Penelope, like you built this thing, you converted it to Rust, like surely you must be close to being finished, right? Um, it turns out the syntax of the Ruby language is extremely fucking weird. Um, this is how we write multi-line strings. We use here dogs. Like why on earth is this a feature of the Ruby language? I don't know, but it turns out you can embed here docs inside other here docs. Like this is a completely legal Ruby program that starts one here doc and then starts another here doc. And like this assembles to a string. Um, you can define classes inside rescue clauses in begin rescue and like these are legal Ruby programs that work and do something reasonable. And that means I have to be able to format them. And these are real stress tests uh, from uh, Ruby formats unit test case. Um, Ripper is weird. Like if you have an array, like one, two, three, it looks very normal and it parses like this. But if you say like A equals one comma star B, which is like how you splat one array into another, like the, par the parse structure completely changes. Um, in Ruby word arrays, parse is arrays. And like this ends up looking like this. And like in Ruby, we just use dynamic types. Like we index into stuff, we see what's there. It works just fine. Um, in Rust, we have to write all of this code just to be able to tell Rust like what all the different possibilities of an array are. It's like a lot more work to be able to convince Rust what the data structure I'm giving it actually is. And so it turns out getting this data structure right is extremely hard because there is no formal specification of the Ruby language. Um, serialization requires a bunch of extra code, but I don't have super a bunch of time to go into that. So let's just quickly summarize. Ruby format is the most incredibly technically complex piece of software I've ever worked on. The code is like so vast, like understanding the grammar of Ruby alone is one of the most complicated technical underpinnings someone could take. Uh, it is really hard. I think I accidentally became a global expert on the syntax of Ruby by doing this, uh, but it's been a lot of fun. Um, I have been really sweating the details and trying very hard to get this right. Uh, I think Ruby deserves to have a really, truly amazing auto formatter. And we don't have one today. And I think I can be the one to do it. I'm so excited to share this with you. Um, I wanted to say like a genuine thanks to the Rubicop and Sorbet teams. They have proven there is an appetite for great developer tooling in the Ruby language. And uh, I should also say I work for Stripe. Stripe is the company that made Sorbet. They are not paying me to say nice things about Sorbet. I just think Sorbet is actually pretty great. And like without it, we wouldn't have been able to build all of this great tooling. Um, if you want to get the code, it's uh, github.com slash Penelope Zone slash Ruby format. Um, that's all I got. These are my contact details. I will leave them up for a couple seconds and I will be happy to take some questions. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Penelope. Before we get to the Q&A, let's give you a short chance to have a drink, relax a little, and I will share with the folks what's going on in the developer dilemmas. So let's have a look. The final tally is 44% of you voted for move fast and break things. 56% of you voted for strive for zero errors. Would you look at that? So folks, let's jump into some questions. Type them into the YouTube chat, please. We'll be bringing them to Penelope as we go.
Uh, Penelope, thank you very much for your talk. Um, we have a few questions. So one of them is, um, can I use uh, Ruby format in RubyMine together uh, with IDFIM? Um, that is a great question. Um, I don't know. Um, I suspect so. I suspect the answer is with with uh, RubyMine, someone would have to write a plugin for it, or um, I believe it has like a formatter selector, um, and so someone would have to reach out to the folks that make RubyMine and be like, please add Ruby format. Um, so you should do that. Um, I but yeah, I don't. The answer is I don't know if they have it integrated today. I certainly have not integrated it yet today. Um, and so I would assume the answer is no. Um, yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, Andy's wondering, great work, Penelope. I was wondering whether Ruby format enforces a maximum line length and how it handles overflow. Yeah, that's a that's a fantastic question. Um, I have gone, so, so the answer is I haven't decided yet. Um, there are sort of currently two modes we're exploring. One is to enforce a line length limit and then like break constructs from being like single line onto multi-line. So for example, Ruby Fauna actually knows today how to take a hash or an array and uh, take it from a single line version with multiple keys or multiple entries to a multi-line version. Um, and it will actually, it, like you can just do that like that. Um, it also knows how to break method chains and by default it will do that uh, by leaving the dot at the end of the line and then just uh, show, I think at the end or beginning, I forget. It's, it's also not important. Um, and so, so, so we kind of have this uh, line length limit enforcement today that's not like fully fleshed out, but that, that's one idea. And then the other idea I have that I, I'm, I'm sort of very much encouraged by is um, respecting the user's choice. So we would let you go as wide as you want, but the very second you break a construct onto multiple lines, we would then apply the multi-line version of whatever construct you're doing. And so, so in that case, if you have a method chain and it's like, say, 300 characters long and you still haven't broken it, we would let you keep that. But the very second you move something down onto the next line, we would actually verticalize the whole thing for you. And so, so like, this is really compelling to me because it lets Ruby developers choose where the length limit is. And I, I'm like not actually convinced that we need to have a hard length limit. Like, no, like, because this is such a varied opinion how wide people's screens are. There are accessibility concerns. Like, I really think, excuse me, uh, I really think that like leaving it somewhat to people's choice is actually a really interesting idea. But then having support so that you can sort of tell the formatter what you want is also is like a is this very compelling idea to me and so so i also think right perhaps more generally than this specific thing like the formatter is going to have to adapt to people work as much as people are going to have to adapt to how the formatter works what i actually saw when i started working in go is that like i changed how i was editing code to tell the formatter what i wanted it to do and my suspicion is that uh, as the formatter improves, uh, people will learn to work with it more than like against it, right? And so the answer is I am not convinced that we should have a hard line length limit, even though there is one today. Uh, I think we still have time for another question. Um, so this one, so Penelope, I was wondering, if it's such a complex project, would you be able to keep it updated with recent Ruby versions and upcoming changes in syntax? Oh, that's a that's a fantastic question. So, so um, if you are following me on Twitter, you will see that uh, as Matts was announcing new syntaxes in Ruby three, I was tweeting like screams in formatter maintainer. Um, Support is not automatic. Support requires like manual coding up of support for new constructs. So actually, like today, Ruby Format does not support the 2.7 uh, case matching uh, pattern matching syntax. Just because like I it, this is an open source project that I am not paid to work on, and I have not uh, yet had time to uh, work on it. Right. 
Um, and that will also be true with uh, any new syntaxes in the final version of Ruby 3. Um, we today, just for pragmatic reasons, uh, support Ruby's, I think it's 2.6 and 2.7. Um, because like supporting older rubies um, is is not something that's sort of like uh, feasible at the moment, and and like that is generally the sort of idea is to only maintain current-ish rubies, and like right now we're catching up, right? So like for example, the Go language was designed from the ground up to support auto formatting, and it still took them more than a year to build the Go formatter. Ruby was in no sense designed to support auto formatting. And like the fact that it even flies at all is like kind of a miracle. Like, like I like I said this in the talk, and I will perhaps reinforce this. Um, I had to learn more about the grammar of the Ruby language than I think perhaps nearly anybody else on the planet, maybe even Matt's actually has at this point in time, because like so many different people have worked on it. Right. Um that and saying that, right, like we're still not there. Like I'm not done yet. Um, and so the idea is that like by by the time we get we're getting close to a 1.0, we will support all of that syntax. We'll also support all of Ruby three, um, and that like that will happen. There's also this question about like what happens if the Ruby language ever makes a breaking change um, to Ruby syntax. And Matt's very philosophically is like. We don't want to make breaking changes. We love compatibility. It's super important. Um, if it becomes impossible for us to support new and old versions of Ruby, that would be perhaps the the only reason Ruby format would ever have like a 2.0 is to break compatibility with a version of Ruby we can no longer maintain if we want to support a new Ruby, right? And at that point, we would also allow breaking syntax changes, um, but the way I sort of look at this is as long as it is possible to represent both, say, Ruby 2.6 and Ruby 4 grammars uh, simultaneously, uh, Ruby format will never need to have a major version or a breaking change. Awesome. Thank you so much, Penelope. This has been absolutely incredible to, to and, and thank you for sharing your journey. It's much appreciated. Of course. So folks, now we're out of time for this segment. We're going to go into a tiny break, and we'll be back at you in about three minutes with Tatiana's talk. See you then. Thanks. <laughs> 